while you're doing that, I'm looking up Cato Kaylin shirtless photos on Google. <laughs> oh, fuck. Wow. Go on. No, he's just in like, he's super ripped. Oh, and now it's like the actor playing him who's like even more ripped. Because in the TV version of your life, everyone will be more ripped. <laughs> Welcome to You're Wrong About, the podcast that takes stories out of the pool house and into the main residence. Oh, Ah. I love how you have all these like moving on up type (laughs) taglines. I think anytime you let someone articulate their situation, that's a form of justice. I just want all of our protagonists to get their GED and go to community college and work in HVAC construction. That's what I'm trying to do. Bettering we're bettering the narratives of our youth. Oh, great. All right. Yeah. So you want the the Kalen Barbieri yeah. HVAC Institute. <laughs> <laughs> I am Michael Hobbs. I'm a reporter for the Huffington Post. I'm Sarah Marshall. I'm a writer at work on a book about the satanic panic. And today we're going to talk about Cato Kalen. And I'm so excited because I decided this late last night as I lay abed thinking about what was truly in my soul and it was Cato Kalen. Yes. You're you're jumping on with me. You're you're joining me on this yes. little time travel trip obsessively back and forth over the same period of 5 days <laughs> in in 1994. So what's the period of time we're going to talk about today? Today we are going to talk about Cato Kalen, mm-hmm. the life of Cato Kalen. Okay. So we're going back in time again as we did with <laughs> with the story of Nicole to 1959, but okay. we're it's not going to take forever. And then we're going to talk about Cato's life with Nicole Mm -hmm. and get as far as his life intersecting with Marsha Clark's. Can I ask you an essay question before we get started? I suppose. Okay. (laughs) So the question I've been wanting to ask you ever since we started this is what do you think happened? Mm. The actual murders. And I know that it's hearsay and we'll never really know, but as maybe the country's leading expert on O.J. Simpson at this point. What is sort of your hunch and your feeling of just how the murders went down? I think O.J. Simpson is the country's leading expert on O.J. Simpson. Okay, fair. And that if we say publicly that I am the country's leading expert, Jeffrey Tubin will challenge me to a duel of manly arts, which I am <laughs> very open to. <laughs> so recently, as I was driving across the country, I was listening to an episode of the Nancy Grace podcast Mm. where Nancy Grace is like shocking new footage of O.J. Simpson confessing to the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and then like siren noises, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, Apparently, at one time, O.J. Simpson was making a TV special to go along with the publication of his book, If I Did It. Oh, God. Yeah. Which was a very cynical cash grab. Mm -hmm. And, And so the TV special that he was making that apparently was shelved and then brought back out many years after the fact and talked about on Nancy Grace, Mm -hmm. there's a recording of him saying, if, if I did this, if I did that, you know, I would have looked in Nicole's window. And then there's this part where like, suddenly the if goes away and he's like, and Nicole really did have a lot of candles. All she really did. I always used to joke was that she wanted to keep utilities down, but Nicole really did have candles everywhere. (laughs) That's really dark. And he just suddenly seems to go back into remembering (laughs) committing the murders and I was listening to it and I was like, I, I can't do this right now. I guess like had this <laughs> visceral feeling of not wanting to listen to it. Hmm. But anyway, I know that, you know, for this, like I need to go back and listen to it in full and think about it and process it and think about, you know, how is he talking about the rest of the events? Because he also maintained, you know, he had this theoretical person named Charlie there. Oh, there was speculation throughout the trial and people still speculate as to the idea that there was a second assailant. You know, how could he have killed two people at once? Oh, the answer is that it's I don't think it's at all unimaginable to to kill two people at roughly the same time. Mm -hmm. We have reason to believe and, and the prosecution will later argue that Nicole was actually unconscious at the time he killed her Mm. because he had rendered her unconscious and then murdered Ron Goldman and then returned to Nicole. I kind of see it as when Ted Bundy does these similarly conditional descriptions of the murders that he did eventually actually in the first person confess to shortly Mm -hmm. before he was executed, he talks about what he calls the entity, which is this thing that takes him over and that he feels has complete control of him Hmm. when he's stalking and, and killing someone. So I feel like if OJ is talking about this other person being with him, I can see that being 
right. part of being able to describe it now only if he is able to outsource that to some other figure, right. some other part of himself. Right. Do you think, because what we know from the police interrogation, it sounds like he went out to hamburgers with Cato. Yeah. And then there's kind of this half an hour, hour long period that he hasn't really accounted for. Much less than an hour. Yeah. Okay. So do you think sort of he came home from hamburgers and was just in a rage and went over there to spy on her and saw her through the window and ended up going inside? Or like, what do you (sighs) think actually happened? Well, there's not a scenario I find most convincing. There are scenarios that I find equally convincing, I think. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, something I have thought about is like if he was so accustomed to spying on her, right, if he Mm -hmm. spent so much time looking in her window You know, this is consistent behavior of his. He Mm -hmm. watches her having sex with other men and Mm -hmm. then harasses her about it. So it makes sense that he would say to himself, you know, after this dance recital where he felt that he had been pushed out and rejected by her and Mm -hmm. made to feel this way by her, made to feel rejected, made to feel unloved. Mm -hmm. But And then it's like, would he go over seeking a confrontation or would he go over saying to himself, I just want to go watch like I do all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me actually read you something. Mm -hmm. In the entry in her diary for June 3rd, Nicole quoted the exact words of OJ's threat. Quote, you hang up on me last night. You're going to pay for this bitch. You're holding money from the IRS. You're going to jail, you fucking cunt. Holy shit. You think you can do any fucking thing you want. You've got it coming. I've already talked to my lawyers about this bitch. They'll get you for tax evasion, bitch. I'll see to it. You're not going to have a dime left, bitch. Etc. No way. To God. me, the most heartbreaking part of all that is that she ends it with etc. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like she's so used <sighs> to this litany yes. of abuse that just like blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 etc. And so yeah. forth, as we right. all know. <laughs> God. So, I mean, the way that he's talking to her nine days earlier. Mm-hmm. I was also thinking a couple episodes ago, as you were describing it, that. He might have also gone over there to spy on her and then he sees Ron Goldman arriving and then he yeah. reads all this into it that like, oh, she's having a guy over after she had dinner with my kids, blah, blah, blah. Right. And he goes in there and confronts them and then the interaction in some way escalates because with the question of premeditation, I mean, you can't say anything is weird because as we've said a million times, so much about this is weird. Or just illogical. Yes. It's it's extremely illogical to plan to murder somebody when you really only have an hour and someone is coming to pick you up and take you on a flight. (laughs) I love how the timing is the part that strikes you as weirdest. You're like, (laughs) if I were going to murder someone, I would I would plan at least three hours, you know, like taking a day trip to Bellingham. Well, it just seems like much it's a much more risky strategy. Yes. Right. Yes. If you were sort of this Hannibal Lecter type of killer, you wouldn't set up a scenario like that. You'd you'd get something with an alibi, et cetera. And so, right. I mean, you know so much more about this than I do, but it's, it makes sense to me that he would have gone over there with a more benign intention than murder, and then something would have sort of set him off once he was there. I think people very rarely commit murders by thinking to themselves, I'm going to go commit a murder now. Right. 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 I don't think that happens in the majority of these cases. I think it you know, often tends to be a heat of the moment thing. And then I think it's like, how do we define premeditation? Because he obviously knew himself to be capable of of harming her. Right. That he might have put himself in a situation where there were going to be more kind of triggers for that kind of impulse around him. Right. And so even if you don't consider it like textbook premeditation. Right. I don't know. It's like these are degrees of intent that like we don't have the legal language to really talk about very right. well. Right. And we have this binary between premeditated and non-premeditated. There's lots of ways you can put yourself into a situation where you know you're going to behave rashly, right? Like yeah. I think of all those letters to Dan Savage where people write in and they're like, oh, there's like a hot fitness instructor who I'm really attracted to, but I'm married and I don't want to cheat on my wife. But, you know, it would be awkward if I stopped taking her exercise class and like stopped <laughs> getting massages from her, right? And it's like, well, you're putting yourself in a situation where like you kind of want to cheat. Right. You know you're putting yourself in a series of situations where if you were to take a a rational approach, you would be able to think it through and understand, like, I'm asking for my will to be compromised by the situations I'm putting myself in. When maybe that means that I I want this thing to happen. Right. Actually, but I can't own that desire. So is that sort of your general theory? Yeah, in a a general way. And I, I can also imagine him. I mean, he had to have had a knife 
with him at at the moment that things escalated i think right. like i don't see a scenario where he like starts an altercation and then leaves and gets a knife and comes back right or grabs a knife from her kitchen counter or something well yeah i guess yeah that is you're right that's possible or she could have come out holding a knife that seems unlikely to me based on what we've mm -hmm. seen before but who i mean what do i know mm. i can also see him bringing a knife and just thinking like i'm not going to kill nicole right or he could have intended to just threaten her right he could have brought it as like i'm gonna brandish the knife to scare her so she won't see other guys anymore Right. I won't do anything with it. Like that could have been what he was telling himself on his way over there. Yeah. And I think he also could have been telling himself that very loudly. Mm. Him telling himself that could be seen as evidence of the fact that on some level he's like, I kind of want to use this knife on Nicole. Yeah. Yeah. I won't do it, but right. I'm just going to have it. <laughs> yeah. I want to go you to know? the buffet, but I'm not going to eat anything. Like my willpower <laughs> will kick in at some point in the future. Right. I mean, I think right. a lot of our planning as humans gives our future selves more credit than we give our present selves, right? You're like, oh, I'll be able to resist this later. Absolutely all of mine. That's why these calls always start 15 to 30 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's sort of the working theory, but with a lot of the details still left quite murky. Yes. I, I've learned from Marsha Clark's mistakes. I'm not going to commit myself to anything before I absolutely have to. That's fair. So uh, yeah, rewind us. Where where are we meeting Cato? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you tell me every single thing you know or think you might know about Cato Kalin? I will tell you that when I was watching Saturday Night Live when mm. I was like 11 years old, which was mm -hmm. my introduction to oj simpson really yes i have very few actual memories of the trial itself because i was mm -hmm. six and seven years old at the time mm -hmm. i remember watching saturday night live reruns and getting a sense of what america at least thought it was and what's interesting about that is that i don't remember learning who marcia clark was i don't remember learning who bob shapiro was i don't remember learning who ron goldman was yeah that's totally true yeah but i knew that there was a guy named kato kalin yeah and it was always interesting to me that like out of this clearly very big story with a big cast of characters and a lot going on this sort of like doofy guy with a perpetually confused expression received so much coverage yeah it is actually interesting it's we seem to find this in a lot of these stories that people who play a very marginal role end up somehow being centered like Fawn Hall. Right. Fawn Hall is totally the Cato Kalin of Iran Contra. Yeah. <laughs> Very similar hairstyles also. Cato <laughs> Kalin also is interesting because he was like a male bimbo. Like he was yes. maybe one of the people in the whole OJ Simpson fiasco who got the most bimbo treatment. That's actually the most of what I remember him. I remember he was just kind of this like goofy dude who was around but it never was clear to me what part he actually played in the murders. And I remember mentally at the time, I always replaced him with Fabio whenever anybody <laughs> brought it up because they had kind of the same hairstyle. And it was, I think Fabio was the first time we had like a male bimbo figure, hmm. right? Like a kind of airhead. He's buff, but he's dumb, et cetera. Yeah. He played that role. And for some reason, even though they don't really look the same, in my head, Cato Kalin sort of was Fabio sitting on the stand. They were both wildly out of their depth in the 90s. I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, what do you know about Cato Kalin? Like, tell me everything. Well, according to the previous episodes, you have learned me that he was originally a friend of Nicole's mm -hmm. and she moved him into her guest house as a sort of, mm -hmm. you know, having a guy as a buffer zone against OJ's abuse. And then OJ managed to OJ Cato from Nicole's house and Nicole's trust into his. And so eventually Cato ended up moving into OJ's guest house. And so mm -hmm. he becomes important because the night of the murders, he had hamburgers with OJ. And then later that night, he hears sort of vague thumps, something when OJ is returning, rushing home from committing these murders. So he's partly an alibi witness and he's partly a incriminating witness, I guess. Right. Which is very interesting because he's someone who at the start of all this has equal capacity to implicate or exonerate OJ. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I have, I think the best possible introduction to Cato Kalin prepared for you, which oh, no. is a highlight reel. Oh no. <laughs> Of Well, really of the whole movie, but prominently featuring Cato of a movie he was in in 1987 called Beach Fever. Oh, I forgot he was like a actor. I totally yeah. forgot about that. He did get opportunities by 
fraternizing with O.J. Simpson. Wow. But here's an example of what he was up to kind of in his prime. He made this when he was 27 or 28. Oh, no. We're going to watch it together. <laughs> okay. This was straight to video, by the way. All bet it is. Three, two, one, go. Beach Fever. We're opening on women's boobs. There were so many movies in the 80s where just in the box art and the opening, they were like, don't worry, you're going to see lots of boobs. One <laughs> boob. Oh, there's Kato. He's oh, on his Kato? little motorcycle. Yeah. Oh, he's driving a motorcycle and there's a dude in the sidecar. The main characters in this movie are Kato Kalin's dude and an Asian American stereotype. Oh. Oh, no. Yeah. He's speaking like replacing his R's and L's with like a really offensive accent. Yeah. Oh. Kato Kalin reminds me of like Kevin Bacon and Tremors a little bit. Oh, his hair. So he has like the Rachel. Yes. I think Kato Kalin inspired the Rachel. I've been thinking about this. I think whoever did the Rachel on Friends was watching the preliminary hearings oh in the Simpson trial in July of 1994 and was like, I know what I'm going to do for Jennifer Aniston. Oh, now there's like a montage. Okay, so they've invented a love potion that makes women really attracted to them. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and now there's like a bad guy in a limo, like every 80s movie. Yes. Yeah, this is the Cobra Kai guy. Oh, there's Kato Ooh. wearing just Nikes and Ooh. tiny shorts. Kato seems miscast for this role because he looks much older than his compatriot. Yeah. He looks like mid-30s. Okay, so they've accidentally turned the area women into sex zombies. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh, and there's... Oh! Yep. It worked out for Kato. That's and then the movie. <laughs> we had like an eight-frame shot at the end of Kato walking away with his arm around a girl. Yeah. That's what his career has been to this point. Straight to video, high concept, racist comedies. <laughs> yeah, but like, I don't know. What did you think of his uh, his presence in that? I don't know. He's he's cute. He doesn't necessarily like command the screen necessarily. No. He's not like, I can't take my eyes off him kind of person. But he seems a sort of Luke Wilson type of actor where he's just like, hmm. he's there. He's fine. He's just kind of like... The guy they need for movies sometimes that are about women. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, I get it. Like, Luke Wilson is who you cast when you're like, this is really about Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Which totally makes sense, I think, in terms of the kinds of adventures he found himself in, where he was like, OJ Simpson, apparently, after Kato moved in with Nicole, he was like very agitated. Mm -hmm. And then he finally comes to the house unannounced and meets Kato. And after that, apparently he was fine. And Cato like becomes friends with OJ's secretary, Kathy hmm. Randa, who's like, yeah, OJ was really worried. And then he realized, yeah, then he met you and he called me and he was like, you're right. That Cato guy is all right. He's no threat. Huh. Like wow. everyone meets Cato and they're like, oh. That's actually kind of magical because he's a good looking guy. And he also was like, definitely like on the make. Oh. His biographer, Mark Elliott talks about when he and Kato were working on the book together, they'd like interview during the day and then Kato would be like, all right, let's, let's go, let's go on the prowl. Let's, uh, let's meet some girls. Yeah. It's actually amazing that, that he projects that vibe. Right. So it's like, so what is it exactly? And like we saw in Beach Fever, he has like very good <laughs> definition. He ran 10 miles a day, yeah. right? Like he used to do this thing when he was a struggling actor, like around the mm -hmm. Beach Fever days, he would buy pizzas he said he spent like 50 dollars a week buying pizzas for casting directors and casting agents and what? then he would put his headshot in a plastic bag under the pizza and write the pizza's on me <laughs> and then he would like borrow a pizza delivery guy costume and like take the pizza no to a way. casting agent and he said he got work that way like he got auditions wow. and, and i think he said he got a part that way it's kind of genius it's very it really speaks i think to the kind of person he seems to have been where like you're like ah look at that yeah it's kind of it's it's just it's really it's funny that he became such a joke because there's something tragic about him too where like he was there yeah he was there for the 911 call the horrible horrible 911 call yeah so you have to wonder about what his his own hindsight of all this was and and then the you know the, i think the criticism people have of him and the reason he was seen as kind of a bimbo was because fame came for him and he grabbed on yeah. and i can see doing that in the wake of a tragedy you know because he became suddenly like this I guess this overnight celebrity less than a month after hmm. the woman he had lived with for a year was murdered by the man right. who he had was living with at the time. Right. I mean, it's the kind of thing that would put you in therapy for years, depending on your capacity 
to, I guess, internalize the shame about that or to internalize your own role in that. I don't know to what extent Cato was sort of capable of that level of self-reflection or if that was something he was doing underneath the sort of bimbo exterior that everybody projected onto him. Right. But if you were living with someone for a year, you've seen this level of abuse, you move in with her abuser, her abuser then kills her probably. Yeah. That's shit that haunts you for decades afterwards. Right. Like in the world we want to live in, like the the Cato of the future <laughs> would be someone who, when OJ approaches him, you know, after this altercation that he stopped, where he didn't see OJ ac- actually strike Nicole, but he did see her yelling at her and threatening her and kicking in her door. This person, you know, after OJ invites him to come live with him, mm-hmm. would be like, wait a minute. This seems like a tactic to separate the woman whose actions and, and life and sense of freedom you're trying to control this seems like a tactic to control her further. And it mm. seems like you're using me against her and yeah. taking my friendship with her away from her as a resource. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be part of that. Right. And I guess the question is like, what, what do we, what ingredients do we need to make the Cato of the future? Right. If we, right. if we learn from the Cato of the past. Uh, do you want to tell us about the ingredients of the Cato of the past? Is that what I we're do. going with? This? <laughs> So you read his entire biography. I read it twice. Yes. Really? Amazing. Cato Kalin, The Whole Truth by Mark oh, Elliott. Fabulous. Conceived with the cooperation of Cato Kalin based on hours and hours of taped interviews with Cato Kalin and then published after Cato Kalin abruptly bowed out of the deal for reasons which once again we will get to, but which are very fun and very legal. I'm so excited. I want us to have a non-abusive childhood so bad, <laughs> like somewhere in this show. I think your wish is going to be granted. <laughs> I'm going to read to you from Cato Kalin The Whole Truth because I feel that Mark Elliott has worked really hard on it yeah. to make it a literary book. Mm-hmm. And I'm proud of him. So I want to honor that a little bit. Yeah. He was born 36 years ago, March 9th, 1959, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the next to youngest of six children. He has three brothers and two sisters. A fourth brother died at birth in 1967. Hmm. He first got the nickname Cato from the TV series The Green Hornet, which all the brothers watched as children. Cato was the Green Hornet's expert karate sidekick. For a while, all the boys in the family were called Cato. The nickname stuck to Brian in high school when he pitched for the baseball team. After that, no one who knew him ever called him Brian again. Oh, so his real name's Brian. Yeah, Brian Kalen. It's not as fun to say. I'm convinced that at least... 15% 15% of Cato Kalen's celebrity came from how much people enjoyed saying Cato Kalen. It's like Benedict Cumberbatch. His father was, by all accounts, a very warm and humorous man. Mm. He owned one of those cask and cleaver type steakhouses and was also a sales representative from a major liquor distributorship. He did fairly well, as one might expect, since Milwaukee's major industry is the production and distribution of hard liquor. Some might say consumption of it as well. Oh, rude. <laughs> by Cato's account, he was a typically happy middle class family. The Kalins lived in a comfortable home in Glendale, right outside Milwaukee. Cato remembers laughing an awful lot as a child. He claims to have been blessed with a set of parents who had great senses of humor and got a big charge out of having a house full of happy kids. Maybe if Paula Barbieri is an example of what it does to you to grow up in an abusive household, Cato Kalin is an example of what it does to you to grow up in a happy, affluent household. (laughs) Yes, but like, where are the people from happy homes? Because yeah. they don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, there are six and they're all living in people's pool houses. Cato attended Our Lady of Good Hope parochial school. He was always the class clown. Because of his ability to make everyone laugh, including the nuns, mm-hmm. he was able to get away with a lot more than most kids. Mm. I really love that detail. He grew up being able to make nuns laugh, which is like a great power in a society ruled by nuns. And then one of the things that he and Nicole used to do together is they would go to church. They were both raised Catholic. They were both, at least Nicole still took Mm -hmm. her religion seriously as an adult. And they would go to church together sometimes. Hmm. Yeah, which I guess like to think about because it's just like, yeah, they both like to party and then they would go to church. Right. Right. So basically, Cato grows up in, by his account, a happy home, Mm -hmm. happy family, Mm -hmm. bunch of Catos running around. Mm -hmm. And his journey is that he's like, I want more. Mm -hmm. I want to be the big Cato. Yeah, the the best Cato. (laughs) The best Cato. I want to go forth and entertain people. Mm -hmm. He decides he wants to be a comedian. And if that doesn't work out, he'll try being a professional baseball player. Oh, okay. 
These are the thoughts we have when we are very young. Yeah, these are very like after school special aspirations. This is great. So yeah, and he was a good athlete when he was a teenager. He made the varsity baseball team his freshman year of high school, mm-hmm. which is a big deal. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll trust you. Sports. Freshmen don't make varsity very often. I feel like the, the oh, yeah. sense you get of Cato is that he had kind of a charmed life. Yeah. Making the nuns laugh, varsity baseball, and his freshman year of high school. Great hair. Great hair, I was just going to say. Yeah. yeah. And he also does a bunch of theater when he's growing up. He was in Oklahoma and Carousel when he was in high school, and he was the king of the senior prom. Oh, So he's popular. Yeah, right? He seems like someone who, like, was very successful at stuff that they tried until they were 18 years old and was like, all right, the rest of my life is going to be like this. It's like people who grew up in Scandinavia. They're like, (laughs) every country has functioning transport. So he goes to UW-Eau Claire for two years. He has a weekly variety show on the school's public access TV network called Cato and Friends. Okay. Let me read to you. Cato recalled making fun of a dean one time and having his show canceled. Mm. The next day, a petition appeared with 3,000 names, and it was promptly reinstated. Whoa. Cato also discovered girls in college, and when he did, determined to make up for lost time. He used, You get the sense that his upbringing was, like, very Catholic. Mm. He used to go from dormitory to dormitory in search of his next great conquest. In his freshman year, Cato developed mononucleosis, Mm. the so-called kissing disease, which, being a good Catholic, he took as a direct warning from above. (laughs) That's when I decided that no matter what, I would not actually sleep with a girl until I got married. And that was one promise I kept. I stayed a virgin until, at the age of 23, I met a woman who was to become my wife. Wow. What a waste of a torso. (laughs) That's actually interesting that he had like a brief period of womanizing and then settled down very early. Very, yeah. And then this marriage didn't really last, but he Mm. attempted to rein himself in and be like, no, I'm going to be the kind of man I was raised to be. Mm -hmm. And I have done too much kissing. (laughs) And then spring break the sophomore year in 1979, he and a buddy go to Redlands, California. He's never been to the West Coast before. Mm. And he arrives and looks at the mountains and looks at the fact that it's 80 miles from L.A. Mm. and is like, I'm going to come back here. Mm. I'm done. It's time for Cato to go west. Mm. And so he basically goes back home long enough to get his stuff together and then drives west with $900 in his pocket in the summer of 1979. So he doesn't graduate from college. He goes to school in California. He goes to Cal State Fullerton. Mm -hmm. He stops eight credits shy of graduating Okay, because he's basically putting all of his energy and trying to make his show business career happen. Right. Right. And the job that he gets immediately after getting to California and the, the industry that he is in for several years is like comedy waiter. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> I didn't know that was like a special kind of waiter. The jobs Cato gets is basically like you can say whatever you want. You can do whatever comedy stuff you want. Just like bring them the food they ask for. Oh, so he's doing comedy and waitering? Yeah, he's a waiter who who, who he waits on you comedically. What? Wait, what? This sounds this sounds insufferable. What what are these restaurants? Do you think millennials killed the the comedic ah. waitering industry? Like that's another thing we killed and we didn't even notice it. Ah, so somebody comes to your table and they're like, What's the deal with Brussels sprouts? Do you want to hear an example? Oh my god, please. From this Kato's sounds book? miserable. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so this is about a place called Bobby McGee's in Brea where Cato works. Windshield wipers slap in time. And Cato says My routine went something like this. I go over to a table of customers, introduce myself, and say, Hi, our special tonight is lobster tails, 50 cents a piece. Really? Sure. Once upon a time, there was this lobster. Oh, my God. (laughs) It's like dad jokes. Yeah. And... Not great food, probably. You get the sense. And this is what people say about what Cato is like to be around that, like, he wasn't that funny, but he was just always trying. Like, he was always <laughs> telling little jokes and stuff. And his <laughs> testimony during the preliminary hearings and then the trial oh, no. really speaks to that. Oh, no. What? He's doing puns in a murder trial? No, there's like, you know, he's asked, wouldn't you think that OJ 
could get you parts in, in movies, maybe. And he's like, we weren't going out for the same parts. Okay. When you watch his testimony, you're like, oh, yes, this is like a career comedy waiter doing his best to be serious. Oh, my God. That's the meanest thing you've ever said about someone on this show. I don't think it's mean. I love <laughs> that he was a comedy waiter for so many years. I think that that would really affect how you relate with people. I mean, I'm glad Cato liked doing it. Yeah, he seems like an extrovert. He seemed to really like... The, the comedy waiting. Yeah. And at the time, he's also trying to make his comedy career happen. And so he would drive to clubs like the Comedy Store mm-hmm. in L.A. on their open mic nights and get there at 6 p.m. and wait to go on at 2 in the morning. No way. And he said he'd perform for like three people and, quote, I'd wind up buying breakfast for them after the show. <laughs> I got absolutely nowhere at an incredibly slow pace. Nice. So I feel like this would be like a great, slightly bleak, but also fun indie movie. Yeah. It's so interesting because this could also be the plot of like a super dark movie, right? Of like some like incel dude. Yeah. He could be the Joker. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> This could be a story of like desperation and dash dreams, but it sounds like Cato is such a sort of upbeat dude that he's enjoying it or like making the most of it. It sounds like he just has like a great attitude about everything. This is why I identify with Cato. Mm. This sort of like untoward optimism. You know, and just the sense of like, I don't know what's going on. I'm totally out of my depth. And I I probably won't be helpful if you like really need someone helpful. But I'm doing my best and I care about you. I saw a bumper sticker once that said, I'm smiling because I don't know what's going on. I feel like that's somewhat what's happening. (laughs) So he marries Cindy, who's the woman who he's saving himself for. Mm -hmm. They meet and get married and his family comes out from Milwaukee for the Mm -hmm. wedding and the night before... He's talking to his dad about how, you know, I, I don't I don't think I want to get married. I don't think I'm ready to get married. This might be a bad idea. And his dad's like, no, no, we're all here. So <laughs> just get married, champ. <laughs> I already used my miles. No one wants to get married anyway. <laughs> and then after two years, they decide to get divorced. And it's mm. hard on Cato's family because it's the first time in recorded history that a Kalen has gotten divorced. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a kid together. Cato has a a daughter named Tiffany Mm. and Cato's dad tries to convince Cato to get an annulment. And it's like, no, I think if you've had a kid, you can't really. Yeah. It's harder that that way. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of proof of. uh, Right. That some things have happened. Yes. At least once. (laughs) This is very poignant. Looking back, Cato realized he never should have married in the first place. Mm. I was only 23 years old, looked like I was 12 and most of the time acted like it, Mm. had no career to speak of, no permanent place to live, and no real prospects. I was a tender babe in a very prickly woods. Hmm. That's a description of him that will continue. So I picture Kato Kaling going through life just like, ow, yeah, ow. (laughs) There's something so interesting, too, about somebody who grows up in like a pretty privileged, pretty stable home having to have these revelations about the way the world works that other people have much younger right he also thought that everyone in the world was catholic until he went to high school oh wow his biographer says and like suddenly went to a majority jewish high school and was like oh wow hmm like there's such a thing as minorities like there's such a thing (laughs) as like not being the dominant group huh yeah he just he seems like someone who who life had treated gently yeah (laughs) I mean, it's sort of sad, but like so much of the way that we form our personalities is in response to hardship. Yeah. Like you don't want to like wish hardship on people so that like they'll be cooler or whatever. But it's also so interesting that these sorts of hardships that he's experiencing in his 20s are like what a lot of people are experiencing when they're 11. Yeah, I really see the kind of like... The great innocence of American ambition in a way in Cato Kalin. Mm. Because I think what the the fact that we forgot but have kind of retained the effect of mm. is that Cato Kalin was kind of aging out of the life he was in. He was 35 yeah. Yeah. when he fell into the spotlight, which is like 35 is not 25. If yeah. he had been a 25 year old beach fever <laughs> pizza delivering comedy waitstaff guy. I think he would have been received differently. Mm. He did get a lot of flack in the media for just the fact that he was a gr- a grown man whose career was like babysitter slash around the house guy. Yeah, when they mint a millennial coin, he should be on it. He's like the first millennial. He's like the pioneer. <laughs> the millennial Magellan. According to him, he has on multiple occasions the experience of getting cast in a big commercial. It's going to be a big campaign. He'll get residuals from it. 
and then his part is cut from it. Okay. So he's one of, I th- one of those people who I think there are a lot of people like this who are like always almost making right. it in an industry, right. like always feeling like they're like about to break through. Mm-hmm. So you're close enough to making it happen that it's like you can convince yourself that it will happen. Yeah. And then in 1987, he makes Beach Fever, mm-hmm. which is like his biggest project so far. And he befriends the director of the film, mm-hmm. who later on introduces him to a guy named Grant Kramer, mm-hmm. because he's making another movie called Little Red Corvette, and he wants Cato and Grant to team up and cast it for him, basically, which is how Cato gets into the casting business. And also ultimately how he meets Nicole because he meets her in Aspen when it's Grant's idea for them to go there for New Year's. So Cato and Nicole in a way were brought together by beach fever. (laughs) Yeah. So Cato and Grant Kramer drive to Aspen on Christmas morning Mm -hmm. of 1992. So on December 30th, they crash a celebrity party at the Ritz Carlton Mm -hmm. It was a very exclusive affair filled with the upper echelon of Aspen players, movie stars, producers, directors, the Donald Trumps, and other regular members of the rich and famous cast. Grant and I decided to sneak in through the kitchen. We got dressed in our best clothes and simply rode up with the waiters in the service elevator. (laughs) Nothing to it. Couldn't they get invited to these parties anyway? I mean, if his partner is like kind of a mover and shaker dude. Well, but like a mover and shaker with the beach fever filmmakers oh right we were into talking to as many great looking women as possible cato said at one point grant saw someone he thought he knew it was nicole brown simpson the book says grant had been introduced to her at a party at oj simpson's house a while back as soon as he saw her he went for it he told cato he had quote always wanted to do her oh i know they went over said hello grant introduced cato to nicole It was obvious that although Grant thought he knew her, neither she nor the friend she was with, Faye Resnick, remembered ever having met him before. Nice. It didn't matter, though, for within minutes they were all laughing together as if they were old friends. One of the weirdest things about being super attractive is that everybody remembers meeting you. Yeah. I feel like that would be very surreal. Yeah. (laughs) And then the book says, in Aspen, the four got along well. Grant and Nicole had really hit it off. I could tell there were sparks flying, Cato said. I liked Faye, but only as a friend. I was really more interested in Catherine Oxenberg, an actress I had recognized as soon as I walked in. I excused myself and went over to talk to her. We struck a harmonious chord, and I wound up spending the night with her while Grant returned to Jerry's condo with Nicole and Faye. Nice. I just love this Catoism. We struck a harmonious chord. <laughs> I think that says a lot about Cato, right? He's just... He, he, he Maybe he has kind of like Jeff Bridges as the dude energy where mm. like... You recognize that he's so oblivious to what's going on yeah. that it's hard to blame him. Yeah. You're like, you seem genuinely well-intentioned. Yeah. It's weird. I know. It's 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 difficult to, like, dislike him, but it's also difficult to, like, really like him because there's also, you know, they talk about active protagonists and passive protagonists in stories. Right. Cato Kalen is definitely a passive protagonist. Yeah. So it's like, it's always difficult to get sort of engaged in these stories where it's not clear like what the protagonist wants or really what's driving them Mm -hmm. other than just circumstance. Yeah. And just that he is just kind of open to follow other people Mm -hmm. along on their adventure. Yeah. And I'm sure Kato Kalin has, has anxiety and worry and, and I'm sure he experiences all, all sorts of emotions. Of course. But the, the major choices in his life do seem marked by like a lack of self reflection. Yeah. Kato says he notices that, Nicole has been seeing a guy back in L.A., but he's calling her while she's in Aspen and she's not calling him back. Yeah. And apparently it takes her a while to feel comfortable having sex with Grant. Hmm. She and Faye call it playing, just like sexual stuff short of that. As we've said on the show before, there's only like four things you can do. So she's doing the other things and not the main thing. (laughs) So, yeah. And so apparently Grant's telling Cato that... They'd done a lot of, quote, fooling around, but Mm -hmm. he still hadn't actually made love to Nicole. Mm -hmm. It was Nicole's choice, he said. She wanted to get to know him a little more before they actually, quote, did it. Mm -hmm. This, according to Cato, only made Grant more determined. So on January 2nd, Cato and Grant drive back to L.A., and then a couple weeks after they all get back, Nicole invites him to an engagement party that she is throwing and Cato goes out in the backyard and Nicole shows him the pool and mm-hmm. the guest house. And he's like, Nicole, who lives here? And she's like, nobody. And he's like, boy, I'd sure, I'd sure be able to love in this neighborhood. And she's like, oh, you can live in there. Oh, 
So they barely know each other at this point. Yeah, they've like spent a few days together in Aspen. Hmm. So Kata moves in. The original agreement is that he's going to live rent free in exchange for child care and dude about houseness. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, Nicole starts charging $500 a month. Okay. My sense is that, you know, she knew Cato and she knew him well enough to know he possessed that very Cato. Really, he wasn't entirely unlike Cato the Akita. Mm-hmm. He was like someone who was like big and strong and formidable and fundamentally very cuddly. Right. Like non threatening. Yeah. If you think about someone who could be like, who you just feel better about having around, you yeah. know? Yeah. And also probably that Cato had hung out with them and kind of like watched and facilitated his friend hooking up with Nicole and like apparently not been weird about it at all. Like that seems like a good litmus test of like, can I have this person around and they won't make it weird right. because they want to start something with right. me. Right. Dudes who don't make it weird get very far in life. Yeah. They get to live in free guest houses yeah. in Brentwood sometimes. <laughs> So it takes Cato several days to move all his stuff because he just has a little sports car. Okay. Which is very cute to picture. <laughs> Cato driving back and forth between mm-hmm. Brentwood and Hermosa Beach. Yeah, yeah, with like one backpack <laughs> at a time. And when he arrives, uh, he's greeted at the door by Nicole's housekeeper, Maria, who Nicole's daughter, Sydney, peeks out from behind mm-hmm. and says, who are you? And it says, Cato Grin put on a funny voice and said, I will be your new neighbor. <laughs> she broke into a big smile. What is your name, young laddie? Sydney, she said, and added that it was okay with her if he moved in. So this is the kind of relationship that he has with the kids, too, where, like, he does funny voices for them. He plays video games with them he plays softball with them like he does spend a lot of time with the yeah. kids actually hmm. it's so interesting because yeah i mean in any other circumstance Cato would have been like a great dude yeah well and they they all lived together for a year and there was no you know there were no real issues yeah he says the only issue actually when he first moves in from his perspective is that she will often sunbathe nude by the pool <laughs> And I know, poor Kato. Yeah. Must be nice. Must be nice. <laughs> and she notices that he gets uncomfortable when he, like, passes her when she's, like, face up because she wants to get an even tan. So mm-hmm. she's, like, turning around a lot. Mm-hmm. And so after the first few days, whenever he comes by, she, like, flips over so that she's on her stomach and he doesn't have to see anything he doesn't want to see. God, by the standards of the story, though, it's like for all the dirtbag behavior that she's experienced in her life, like this is extremely undirtbag behavior, right? That like, yes, I don't feel super appropriate about you being naked around me. And like, instead of being fucking weird about it or like trying something with you, I'm yes. going to in some way signal that let's keep this platonic, basically. Yeah, I feel like it's unfair that like, Kato Kalin and Faye Resnick were like two of the people who were kind of the most mercilessly roasted in the press. Yeah. And also they seem to have been people who were like genuinely interested in being Nicole's friend. Right. And like despite whatever limitations they had, like they did really try and they did really care about her. Yeah. Yeah. So like why are they the ones that were taking this much out on? Yeah. I mean, does it come from that feeling of like if I'd been there... I would have known things that I still clearly right. culturally don't know about domestic violence because look at how people are talking about Nicole's marriage even after the murder. It's just amazing these tiny little moments of grace. And it's like such a, in some ways, inconsequential moment of grace, but just like an extremely attractive woman who a man is around who doesn't try to take advantage of her. Yeah. It's just like, wow. Like by the standards of this story, we're like medal of honor for Cato. <laughs> right. Yes, it's we're grading on a curve. Yeah, my God. And Grant basically breaks things off with Nicole after he does finally, quote, do it with her. Aww. And then Nicole gets pretty hung up on Grant, mm. according to Cato Kalin. Okay. Here, here, I'll read this to you. Grant invited Cato to a party to watch the game, and Cato asked Nicole if she wanted to come along. It apparently never occurred to him that Kathy's presence might create a problem. Kathy is Grant's new girl. Sure enough, when Nicole showed up, she became annoyed when Grant paid more attention to Kathy than to her. And when she and Cato got home, she said she wanted to talk to him about what had happened. It was the beginning of a new phase in their relationship, one in which Nicole would confide her innermost secrets to her new house guest. (laughs) That night, she told him that for the first time in her life, being at the party had made her feel self-conscious about her age. (laughs) After all, she told Cato, she was in her early 30s, and Grant's girlfriend was only 19, 20 tops. Oh. Nicole said she felt like she was not only the other woman in Grant's life, but the older woman. Hmm. And that's when she tells Cato that she doesn't want Grant 
coming over ever. Hmm. And that's also when he kind of proves himself as someone who she can be like, hey, like, please don't do this. Right. Like, here's how I feel about this. And this is why I want you to do this. And he's like, okay. Right. (laughs) I mean, it also illustrates sort of, in some ways, his obliviousness. Yeah. That he's like, this will be totally fine. Why yeah. Because if I went to a party that my ex were having with their younger, more attractive yeah. new partner, I don't think I would care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm Kato Kalen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was a varsity baseball player when I was 14. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's also like, it's also a deepening of the relationship too, right? Like a nice deepening yeah. that she's now telling him stuff and has a man that she's confiding in and who isn't using that against her the way that OJ has. Yeah. And I think it also, it really sucks that we have to have spent so much time speculating and, you know, and that some people will continue to speculate about like, what was the nature of her relationship with, with Ron Goldman or Kato Kalin and were they having sex or were they gonna? And it's like, well, we could focus on that, but we could also talk about how, like, isn't it interesting that it was, seemed to be this meaningful maybe even therapeutic thing for her for her to have just like platonic friendships with men yeah just for there to be men in her life who she trusted and who were worthy of her trust like that's actually kind of amazing that she was doing that yes and who also were considerate in that you're asking me not to bring my friend grant over okay i'm gonna respect that right right it's the kind of thing that oj wouldn't do right i think just the experience of like saying someone like hey like it would mean a lot to me if you would do this thing for me and to have someone like just do it. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, Kato. Oh, Kato. <laughs> there was so much that he couldn't do, but then there were things there were things that Kato Kalen could do. Yeah. I mean, I guess as with so many of these things, it's like what what can people offer other people and then what are the limits of what they can offer other people? Yeah. And then what are causing those limits? Yeah. And how do we design the Kato of the future? Does he mention the abuse? Other than the 911 call, does he see it? Like, does he see signs of it everywhere? Or is that a unique case? I mean, it's a while before he even meets OJ. He just, like, hears tell of him. Okay. She tells Kato that she thinks OJ has people spying on her. She tells him that she feels her life is in danger Mm -hmm. and that he could kill her and get away with it. I mean, yes. But then at other times, she's reconciling with OJ. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Let's not talk about all that other stuff we talked about before. Hmm. This is like too much emotional complexity for Kato Kaylin to handle, I feel like. It's too much complexity for any of us to handle. I mean, also you know? that. I mean the the people at the top of, of any field in the United States like have historically really struggled with these concepts. Mm-hmm. Why do we expect Kato Kaylin, you know, baseball star of <laughs> Nicolay High? <laughs> <laughs> To be able to do what the LAPD couldn't do. I mean, Ron Shipp also knew about a lot of this, and he was the one who did domestic violence training for Los Angeles cops. So the degree of ignorance here is really feels hard to overstate. Yeah. And so the football season ends in 1993, and OJ is working less because that's kind of the bread and butter of his work, aside from golfing for Hertz type stuff, Mm -hmm. is football announcing. And so he's around more. He sees Cato more. He and Nicole are attempting this reconciliation that they began in the in the spring of 93, mm-hmm. where, you know, she decides, I really want to be back with OJ. I really want to make this work again. Mm-hmm. And so Cato starts seeing OJ a lot more, too. Hmm. And so OJ does stuff like he takes him on the set of the Naked Gun 33 and a half, which he's making. No, 33 and a third. At that time. Oh, sorry. It's two and a half. Yeah. OJ. <laughs> Sarah. I'm sorry. We insist on accuracy <laughs> in this podcast. 33 and a third. And Cato is like really dazzled and delighted by this. And he especially enjoys that Leslie Nielsen has a battery device where he'll like, he can start just like fart noises emanating from his person. Okay. And at the end of the day, OJ, in a casual, almost choking manner, reminded Cato that he was still living at Nicole's. And of course, there were certain things he just couldn't tell her. Kato reassured him that he had nothing to worry about, that he would never do anything like that. Hmm. Besides, he said, why would it matter? After all, they were no longer married. It matters, OJ said. Hmm. And this is about, you know, OJ taking Kato out in his adventures with other women and, you know, not still needing to deceive Nicole about that. Oh, so he wants Kato to keep his secrets, basically. Yeah. In May of 1993, at the start of this attempted reconciliation, Nicole and OJ go to Cabo which is where a year later they're going to have their other terrible Cabo trip where OJ makes his frog man right. comments. Right. 
But a year earlier, Nicole comes back from this 1993 trip to Cabo, and according to the book, Nicole told Cato how awful the first two days had been. It began as one of the worst trips of my life, she said. The reason, she explained, was that OJ had set out to prove that he was still able to satisfy her sexually. He insisted upon making love to her five times a day, she said Whoa. violently, all while screaming, I'll do you like no one else can do you. Oh my god. She told Cato she begged him to ease up. OJ, please give me a break. She said it wasn't until the third day that he just physically wore himself out. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. Ugh, ugh. As painful as this may be for her, like, if she's to try and say no, like, we know that the 1989 New Year's beating starts with her refusing to give him oral sex. So right. what would happen if she said no? Right. There's no consent when the alternative to sex is... right. Something even more violent. Right. And you don't have to make a physical threat to someone in that situation. It's just understood by both parties. Yeah, which is just harrowing. You know, and so Cato hears all this. And his first meeting with OJ is after he learns about this Cabo trip. And he still hangs out with OJ. He still goes to the sets with him. He still strikes up this friendship with OJ knowing all this. Yeah, it's like he knows that OJ did this and he's also able to go hang out with him and Leslie Nielsen. Right. Right. And I feel like the question is just like, why? <laughs> right. What were the factors that allowed this bystander who like hadn't been part of this relationship for years and years at this point to be like, well, I guess you're telling me that it's fine. And so I guess I, okay. Right. Or like I went because he invited me. Right. Lots of people agree to do things that they're asked to do without really thinking them through. Mm -hmm. Especially people that have this kind of Cato like obliviousness. Right. Or just like, you know, you like Nicole says things are fine with you now. Yeah. We're just getting at the fact that like, we won't always know what to do. Right. Cato lives in all of us, <laughs> which says hopeful things for our hair. <laughs> Cato also says, I don't really know what to think of the story. Cato says that there's one night when he and Nicole are drinking and she's drinking pretty heavily. And she says, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm falling in love with you. What? Cato felt the blood drain from his face. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. No, you're not, he said. Yes, I am, she insisted. I've had dreams about you. He remembered now how sometimes in the mornings he'd meet Nicole in her kitchen for coffee and she'd say, whoa, you don't want to be around me today. I had a dream about you. Okay. Come on, he'd say, thinking she was teasing him. Were we doing things? Was I good? He remembered how she'd laugh and that would be it. Now, though, she wasn't laughing. No, uh, hey, listen, Nicole, I love you, too, as a friend, but we could never be romantically involved. I couldn't do it. He meant it. He insisted he wasn't sexually attracted to her and was canny enough to know it could never work any other way between them than the way it was now. But Cato, she went on, it's perfect. The kids love you. Nicole, he said, groping for excuses. I'm not a wealthy guy. I live in a guest house, remember? I'm the guy who was late with his rent. You're going to be very famous one day soon, Cato, she replied. I can feel it. Yeah, and I'll be able to afford to move into a larger guest house. <laughs> Nicole sensed his unease. I know you're uncomfortable about what I've said, she told him, but I had to say it. With that, she smiled and went back into the living room. Hmm. What do you think about that? I mean, I like imagining Nicole running off with Cato. Yeah. And having just like a normal L.A. life together with this like nice guy who, as long as the circumstances don't put him into terrible situations, is like a pretty dope husband. Yeah. I mean, they would get divorced too eventually, but he would be the ex-husband <laughs> who like, you're like, oh, it's Cato's weekend with the kids. Yeah. <laughs> I hope he doesn't take them dirt biking again. Yeah. For all his faults, it doesn't seem like he has temper issues, impulse control issues, violence issues. It doesn't seem... Like, he would be an agent of chaos in anybody's life. When I first read this, my first thought was like, hmm, did that really happen? I've never... And also because other people were like, oh, no, yeah, she wasn't interested in Cato. Nope, no tension between her and Cato. Right. Do, do, do. I think because of that, I was like, did Cato Kalen just throw this in here just as a self-aggrandizing mm. thing? But now, reading it again this week, though, because I spent a couple days like in this book really, really thinking about Cato Kalen, I was like, you know, I believe that. Like, it does seem to me like completely possible that like if you're living with this guy who's like sweet and harmless and ripped and loves yeah. your kids and your kids love him and there's a scary guy chasing you around that... You know, even if you didn't necessarily have like a ton of romantic tension with him at any other time, would have a moment of like, Cato, just like, ah, 
fuck everything. Let's just yeah. you and me. Yeah, I mean, it's not nuts. You know, like people are attracted to each other in some moments and yeah. not at others. Yeah. These are like yeah. two hot people. Right. Doing hot people stuff. But, you know, the on again, off again reconciliation continues between Nicole and OJ. Mm hmm. And then Cato talks about the incident on October 25th, 1993, that we heard part of in the 911 call. Right. When OJ came in and kicked in the back door. Yeah. Nicole is on the phone with the 911 operator and OJ is terrorizing her. And Cato at first decides to just head to his guest house. And then before he closes the door, he takes another look and decides he needs to go mm -hmm. in and, and try and calm OJ down. Which he does, and he kind of distracts OJ. And when the police come, they ask Cato to fix the French doors that OJ has kicked in. Mm. And Mark Elliott writes, After the police left, Cato continued to try to make repairs while Nicole, still upset, began talking. Mm. She said she couldn't believe the kids had slept through the whole noisy altercation. When she was still married to OJ, she told Cato they used to fight all the time in front of the children. Hmm. It got to the point where Sydney, in Nicole's words, was so used to the fighting it became a normal part of her life, which is why Ugh. she had to have a security blanket and continually sucked on her fingers. Ugh. Cato asked Nicole what had happened to provoke OJ into, quote, the kind of rage I'd never experienced before. Absolutely nothing, she said. OJ's just, we're fighting again. She told Cato OJ had come over a few nights earlier and had seen some photos of her and a man she used to date on the den table. That had kicked off a new round of fights between them. This is the man who's sleeping with a photo of Paula Barbieri nude yeah. by his bed. Right. And probably cheating on Paula Barbieri <laughs> with other people, too. Yeah. In light of OJ's repeated concern for what Nicole is doing while the kids are sleeping upstairs, the kids are sleeping upstairs at Nicole's house the night that she's murdered mm. outside her front door. Mm. Do they hear anything? What 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 happens with them? Officer Risk finds them sleeping, apparently sleeping in their rooms when he is the first officer at the scene. Mm -hmm. And then after the murder, do they go live with OJ's sister or something? Like what what what's the custody situation afterwards? They live with Nicole's family okay. after OJ is taken into custody. I wish there was some way for courts or somebody to order that like some people shouldn't be famous. I feel like <laughs> with kids like that, they go through something so terrible at such a young point in their life. I feel like the best thing that everybody can do is just like unfame them. Like a witness protection program. Yeah. The way we do with like the sons and daughters of presidents. Right. I wish there was a way for everyone to just get together like a Slack channel and just like, we're going to leave these kids alone forever. Yeah. That's what the Illuminati should be for. I know. <laughs> I it's know. just like talking about who we're gonna <laughs> leave. I know, and also like if Sydney Simpson wins a flower arranging competition today, the headline will be yeah. like "Daughter of this tragic right. situation." Yeah. So after Nicole and Cato talk post fight, Cato goes back to his guest house, and OJ calls and asks him to come over to his house and have a little talk about what just happened and what Cato just saw oh wow like the same day yeah that very night oh wow and kato says okay i don't know let me call you back <laughs> okay and then he goes to the main house to talk to nicole and told her about oj calling and she in his words freaked out if you go over there she cried i'll hate you don't you dare go over there mm. yeah kato was surprised although he should have expected that reaction he hadn't okay he said but he really sounded upset on the phone Cato, she said, on the edge of tears, he's trying to manipulate you. Don't you see? I don't want you going over there. Okay, he said. I won't. Should I call him back? If you have to, Nicole said quietly. Cato ultimately decides not to call OJ back okay. and just to do what Nicole says. Good. What do you think of that little interaction? It's just, again, it's like you have to keep telling this guy, like, basic stuff. Right. You're like, no, Cato, you're being manipulated right now. Right. I mean, at least he asked her. My God. He does well if he's given direction. Right. Right. <laughs> Constant direction. Yeah. And then Elliot writes, looking back on the incident, Cato recalled, by the time I saw OJ again, he and Nicole had made peace. The incident seemed completely forgotten by the both of them. At least that's the way they acted, as if neither wanted to admit it had ever taken place. Mm. Later on, when I began seeing OJ more frequently, he did mention it to me one more time, although not in any apologetic or explanatory way. 
I don't remember how it came up, but he brushed it off, insisting it had been no big thing. Hmm. So they're also living in this kind of mini society where for as long as Nicole and OJ are together, Nicole has to respect OJ's needed reality of like, it wasn't a big deal. Right. You provoked me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't count. And then Nicole decides that she needs to downsize and move out of the house on Gretna Green with the guest house. And when she finds the Bundy condo, she writes Cato a note saying that he can move in with them. They all really wanted to live with them. He can pay the same rent. And she would only let him move out. Quote, when you find a wife, oh, no, she signed the note, love me. Aw. At the same time, OJ is talking about maybe selling his house on Rockingham and moving Nicole and the kids to Florida. Okay. And starting a new life there, which to me is a little bit sinister, given the context of what we're seeing from this reconciliation with him trying to kind of control her friends and yeah. spy on her and follow her. But they don't do that. She does decide to move into the house on Bundy. And then we're going to jump ahead to Cato's testimony in O.K. Simpson's trial, March 21st, 1995, mm -hmm. being questioned by Marcia Clark. And Marcia says, did you ever move into the Bundy townhouse that Nicole purchased in January 1994 that you were going to? Cato, no. Marcia, why not? Why did you do that? Cato, because OJ asked me to go to his house. I mean, it was part of a deal. I went there instead of moving in with Nicole. Marcia, what did the defendant say to you about moving into his house instead of Nicole's condominium? Cato, I mean, we talked about it, and it was sort of like the right thing to do, not to be in the same house, that I should probably not go there. And OJ offered me his place. It was free, and he said you can stay as long as you want. And when it was time for you to go, he'd let me know. Marcia, did he indicate with you with respect to what he thought of the fact that you'd be living in the same house with Nicole? Cato, didn't like it, but it probably wouldn't be right. So again, he asked me to do it. I didn't really think it through. Right. According to Cato, he's already thinking, I'm not going to have my own little dwelling anymore. I used to have a lot more privacy. Yeah. And at the same time, OJ is like, listen, I just don't think it would feel right for you to be living in the same house. According to OJ, like that's where he's going to draw a line. And Cato's like, sure, I understand. I was kind of maybe not super keen on staying there anyway. So can I just stay at Nicole's until I find a new place? Because I do have to find a new place now. And OJ's like, oh, no, you can live with me. Oh. And Cato's like, well, I can't afford to live with you. And OJ's like, just come for free. In Cato's mind, it's it's probably just an uncomplicated lateral move. I'm going from one place to another. This one has lower rent. Maybe it's bigger. Maybe there's a better TV or whatever. And I think he's also like primarily looking out for Cato. Like I think yeah. in, maybe in the moment he's like, I kind of wanted to find a new place to live. This is a better deal for Cato. Like in these like big decisions, like we do tend to maybe think that way first. Yeah. And according to Cato, he goes in to talk to Nicole and says, guess what? OK doesn't feel it's right for me to move in with you and the kids. So he's offered to let me live in his guest house for free. Oh, my God. Isn't that great? <laughs> oh, my God. And Nicole says, he's manipulating you, Cato. Don't you see what he's trying to do? Cato, think it through. Cato claims he couldn't believe what he was hearing and couldn't understand what she was so upset about. Apparently, the idea of betrayal never entered his mind. Instead, he tried to explain to her how perfect this seemed to him. But Nicole didn't want to hear any of it. She became extremely upset and cut short the discussion. Cato went back to the guest house and started packing. A few minutes later, Nicole came by to tell him she was sorry for blowing up. That she was okay with his moving in with OJ, and that she wasn't even angry for him for doing this to us. She said, every time I make a friend, he takes them away from me. Mm. And then apparently, a little later, Nicole's friend Cora Fishman comes over, and Cato's talking to Cora about how Nicole's much more upset than he thought she would be, and Cora says maybe it's that Nicole was counting on him for the rent money every month, and he's like, oh... Oh, my God, Cato. <laughs> and he goes and talks to Nicole and is like, wait, Cora said that you might need me for the rent money every month. So if that's true, I'll go. I'll I'll live with you. Like, I understand. And according to Cato Kalen, the whole truth, Nicole, without emotion, said to the house guest she had once declared with happiness and conviction she'd wanted to be friends with for the rest of her life. It's OK. Go live with OJ. Aww. It's so sad that she is perceiving the situation exactly as it is. Right. I mean, as in so many chapters of her life, it's like she gets it. Everyone yeah. around her is like, oh. Yeah. No one is able to take her seriously when she's yeah. just stating the truth of what's going on. Like, he's manipulating you. He is taking you away from me. Mm -hmm. 
he is taking one of my strengths and turning it into one of my weaknesses and you're letting it happen. Yeah. And this is what always happens. Yeah. You can feel her like deep sigh, <sighs> just sort of watching all of this of like, of course, right? Like, of course, Kato is leaving. Of course, Kato is leaving to move in with my abusive ex-husband. Like, of fucking course. Yeah. And like, why would I think that I could possibly have someone on my side? Like, right. why even try? Right. I feel like what's saddest for me about thinking about that little moment is that Kato actually like kind of cluelessly signs on for this clearly bad idea and then is like think and then actually thinks about it for a second. Yeah. It's like, oh, Oh, Nicole, I'm sorry. Like, I, I'll totally live with you. I didn't realize you might be counting on me. Right. You know, and he's thinking of rent. Yeah. But like, that could be a stand in for anything. And she's just like, no, yeah. just go. Just go. The kind of privilege that you need to go through life this oblivious is really fascinating. Yeah. It's like a sort of easily attractive, friendly, varsity baseball team kind of guy. Right. You're just like, I just do what people tell me to. And then when they tell me... Like, hey, that was mean. I'm like, hey, okay, sorry. It was mean. But he's never thinking of what does it mean for me to move out? Or that he's like, like so many other people in the story, he understands that they're like, he sees that he sees the way OJ is breaking into her house. So she's making this 911 call. He sees this fury in him that he says is unlike anything he's ever seen before. So like he's registering what's going on. He's not yeah. like, oh, OJ is just... Got kind of a short fuse, but it's fine. Like, it seems like he's genuinely scared of him. Right. But just, you know, in the absence of overwhelming evidence, the contrary is able to be like, well, I think, but in the end, it's fine. And they're reconciling and Nicole's not in danger. Right. I Like, I wonder if, like, how much of this is denial and just the desire to believe that, like, if people say things are fine, that they really are fine. Right. Right. I also wonder, like, how many of America's lawmakers are essentially Cato Kalin? We're like, they're not bad people. They don't want to do bad things in the world, but they are literally or spiritually former varsity baseball players from Glendale <laughs> who just are well-intentioned and need to be given direct instructions about every thing in life that doesn't pertain directly right. to their interests, you know, who just like right. so many of the people in who inhabit roles in America where they really do need to understand abuse dynamics and they really do need to understand what it means to have a complex set of obligations to the people around you and to your community. And, you know, who just it's not a willingness thing. It's a capacity thing. Right. It's also so interesting thinking about it in context of what we consider to be the bystander effect, right? Where there's this right. myth that all these people watched Kitty Genovese get stabbed to death and sort of shrugged and didn't call the cops. It's like we think of the bystander effect in terms of did you see it or did you not see it? Whereas there's also things like this where it's like he did see it, but he didn't contextualize it. Yeah. He saw what he needed to see. He just didn't do anything about it. It's so much, life is so much less scary in this weird, dark, forensic files informed worldview where you're like, people have the capacity to save each other, but they choose not to because they're evil. Like, right. that's much less scary. Yeah. I think this world where all these, like, hyper-competent yet evil people are walking around right. where it's like, no, the world is just full of Kato Kalins. Right. The right. worst things that happen in this world happen because of just <laughs> doofy people with a lack of capacity for what they're really needed to do in the moment when they're needed. Never trust good baseball players. <laughs> Boom. Don't trust the prom kings. Yes. <laughs> they probably don't want to hurt you, but maybe they can't help you very much either. Yes. Is that where we're stopping? Are we done? Yeah. <laughs> so tell us, what are we going to hear about next time? We're going to hear more about Cato's adventures because that is going to take us through Cato basically in his Cato way, mm -hmm. hanging out with OJ on the afternoon of June 12th. Okay. And cluelessly tagging along to mcdonald's with him we are all in some way cluelessly tagging along to mcdonald's somewhere merry christmas merry christmas <laughs> <laughs>